Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here, voice in tack for Mondays with Mr. Happy, aka Mr. Happy Mondays. Last week was not a good week for me. Uh, some of you may remember, I barely had a voice going into last week's video from the stomach flu that I had had over the weekend. And that day, I ended up having a corneal abrasion. Something got in my eye, don't know what it is. And over the course of the day, it got worse and worse. Eventually, I had to go to the emergency room, get some eye drops and medication, and now that's all taken care of. So... Now that my week from hell is done and I've been able to get back onto working, I'm going to be playing a lot of different games over the course of the next few months, especially while we're waiting for Heaven's Word. So, uh, feel free to ask me questions about whatever, any of the videos that you see. I just usually pick the questions uh, at random from the previous week's video. And, uh, well, let's just get right into those questions, shall we? So, I noticed just scrolling through, I have a lot of really long ones, so I apologize if I cut your question short a little bit. I want to do my best to answer what I can, though. Hey, Mr. Happy, question for week 26, hashtag Mondays with Mr. Happy, hashtag Mr. Happy Mondays. Thanks for always greeting me on Twitch. Anyway, I don't know if you've ever played DCUO, have not, but a lot of the instances in the game, uh, you were paired with two to four people regardless of roles. There was no need for tanks nor healers because everyone had their own one or two self-heal spells and healing items, and all the bosses in the game had barrels that drop barriers that regenerate health. While I could bring a tank and heals, most instances were manageable with four DPS, even though all the classes could be DPS or a specific role. Do you think you could ever see something similar to this type of content in Final Fantasy XIV? Uh, how would you feel about it? So, that's not the only game. A game that I have played that doesn't make use of a tank or healer is Guild Wars 2. And it's doable, but what usually happens when you make it so that you don't need the holy trinity of tank, DPS, healer, is that the fights are generally easy. Um, depending on, of course, who you are. Some people have more trouble with those fights because they require you to be a little bit more active. Usually you have to dodge a lot more, but there's less sort of, uh, jump rope mechanics to go through. And those are really what, um, what cause a lot of people to struggle are the team jump rope mechanics. So... I think there's strengths and weaknesses to both. The weaknesses of tank of the Holy Trinity is that some mechanics get overused a lot, like tank swapping. That's a big one that gets overused a lot. Um, I don't see anything wrong with it, but it has to be done so in a way that having four DPS is not more beneficial than having a tank or a healer. And that starts to get difficult because then the content needs to be so easy that you could clear it without any healers or tanks, but it needs to be at a level at least where bringing a tank or a healer isn't going to hinder you in any way and most of the time people will run with the tank and the healer just for the safety especially in something like the duty finder so um i'm not a big fan of it i would be okay with it being part of content that's not really progression or not super high progression uh but if i wouldn't really want any like coil fights that are like that or anything like that because not you know having the people that want to play tank or healer and them not getting involved in the end game content because you just don't need a tank or healer i think that's even worse than not having the option of going all dps next one question for episode 26 dear mr happy what do you think will happen to the current zodiac weapon quest line when heaven's word comes out okay i put a video up about this um sometime it was either last week or the week before i can't remember i think i was sick when i did the video so um what we understand is that you won't need to have the relic done in patch 3.1. We're not going to see a continuation until 3.1 when it comes to uh, a relic weapon or a Zodiac quest line or anything like that. It may be a continuation of the Zodiac, although we've been told 2.51 will be the ultimate Zodiac weapon or its sequel. That's what Yoshi P said. Whether it be the Zodiac weapon or its sequel, you will be able to continue growing a weapon in 3.1 and that... They will remember, they will honor the people who completed a Zodiac weapon before 3.1 and give them some sort of advantage going forward. So the way it sounds, you don't need it done to do the next Relic quest line that's going to be in Heaven's Word, but having one done will at least give you a boost with the initial step going into patch 3.1. Another one that said question for episode 26, what are your thoughts on the upcoming Final Fantasy titles outside of Realm Reborn, which you are obviously excited about? Glad that you noticed. Uh, Type Zero is a game that I've only heard about for years now. Ever since it came out in Japan and we haven't had it here, I never got the pleasure of playing it, importing it, whatever. So I'm excited to play it for the PlayStation 4. Doubly excited to actually get my hands on something playable for Final Fantasy 15. I don't care if they change it at all. The Final Fantasy 12 demo was barely what the, what the game was like at all. I just want to know that this game is real. It's going to exist at some point and I can't wait. I, I, I just can't wait. That's that's all I gotta say. I can't wait. 
Next question. My question is kind of two questions, really. It's really short for two questions. In terms of rating, and please also tangent into general play, what do you consider defining a player as hardcore and as casual? Now, this is a great question because there are two kinds of hardcore and two kinds of casual. Because the person who plays a game 16 hours a day but doesn't focus on any of the end game progression, you would still call them hardcore, right? Because they play the game 16 hours a day. You wouldn't call that person a casual. Um, but the person who plays four hours a day, maybe a few times a week, but is always clearing all the content, cutting edge, always at the front lines of completing content, you wouldn't call that person a casual. So really there's hardcore in terms of time investment and raid progression, and then there's casual in both of those. That's why you'll sometimes hear people say, oh, I'm a hardcore casual, meaning that you play 16 hours a day, but you're not focused on any end game content, or eh, I'm a casual hardcore. I play a few nights a week. I clear my raids. Uh, I've been clearing them since they came out, and that's what I do. So, both of those things exist. It's just a matter of identifying where you fall on the list of things. What boss is the sexiest male boss? Somebody answered Rock Hard Titan. What's the difference between Rock Hard Titan and just Titan? <sighs> Next question. Mr. Happy, what types of games do you like to play? Do you like horror games? Keep up, the, keep up with the good smiley face. I'm going to start watching streams. Thank you. Um, I mostly play RPGs. I like to give other games a try. Uh, F like FPS games. I actually enjoy FPS games, which seems weird because, you know, I talk a lot of crap about Call of Duty and Battlefield and all that. But I loved Modern Warfare 2. I loved Bad Company 2, Battlefield Bad Company 2. Um, and I've loved a lot of FPS games over the years, especially the less traditional ones. I remember playing Doom 3 at a friend's house. I loved Halo growing up. Uh, so I guess it's really... I just enjoy games that I can appreciate. Like, the Halo series, I appreciated a lot of it. I appreciate the gunplay. Destiny is a game that, while I heavily, heavily criticize a lot of the decisions they made, I love the gunplay. Um, RPGs, I love it. I love the leveling progress. I'm, I love leveling. It's a really, really weird thing. When I'm going through the story of an RPG, I love leveling. I love um, modifying stats and gaining progression. I love action RPGs. I just like pretty much every game out there, as long as, you know, the art style appeals to me, the sound appeals to me, as long as it's a good game, at least a little bit. I even like some of the less good games over the years. Uh, so really, I'll play anything. As for horror games, uh, I'm a little bit of a bitch. <laughs> so I actually love watching other people play horror games. I'm one of those people who will go on YouTube, not watch, not really PewDiePie, but like uh, I'll watch videos just of random people I don't even know, just so I can see these horror games, these indie horror games out there that are being made, or when a big horror game comes out, I'll watch that as well. Not a good, not very good at playing them. Next question, Mr. Happy, I wanted to ask you a question for your next Q&A. You're doing it in the right place. Do you only answer questions about 14, or do you answer questions about other games? Dude, I just pick questions. Like, it doesn't matter, really. You could ask whatever, and I just kind of go through them at random. If I see it's a question that I ask, or I've answered a lot, sometimes I'll be like, I'll wait maybe a few more weeks before I address that question again. But, um, yeah. And if so, do you play Monster Hunter? Never played any of the Monster Hunter games. Always wanted to. I I don't remember why I haven't. I know the more recent ones, I think, have been on the PSP and the Vita, and I don't have any handheld systems, so that's why. Or portable systems, I should call them. Uh, I always wanted to play Monster Hunter, but I could never get it. I don't know why. Just never lined up. Uh, I would be excited for Monster Hunter 4, but I probably won't get to play it. If I could play it, though, I definitely would. Final Fantasy Explorer is another game that I would definitely like to play. I think Monster Hunter would make a good MMO. Isn't there already a Monster Hunter MMO out there? I feel like there is. I, mean, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think it would. I think it'd be fun. I don't know. Kind of remind me of like a Korean Grindfest MMO, like Vindictus maybe. Monster Hunter's not anything like Vindictus, but I imagine an MMO version of the game being a little bit like Vindictus. I think it could be good though. Next question, when do you think the loot lockout on Final Coil of Bahamut will be lifted, and when do you think it'll be nerfed? We're not getting a 2.6, so I've been wondering. Bonus question! Whoa! What nerfs could you first see in the Final Coil turns? All those, the answer to all your questions is, it won't matter. It's gonna get lifted in 3.0, which will be bringing the level cap up to 60, which will make Final Coil irrelevant other than its story concepts, or for vanity gears, or the minion, or whatever. Um, it's not gonna get nerfed, probably, until the same point, so people can finish it for the story. And, uh, what nerfs? I don't know, like, 
I'd say turn 10, reduce the damage of Wild Charge and Cyclonic Chaos, so you only need two or three people for each of them. Like, you just need the off tank for Wild Charge or something like that. The adds maybe not hit as hard, or, uh, or maybe generates Electro Charge stacks. 11 would probably have to be something with Tethers. I don't know, because there's, I don't know, there's not really much else that needs... Oh, uh, the, the Lightning blowing up thing probably wouldn't insta-kill people. 12? Mmm... Benyu's HP and Rebirth Flame damage, probably. There's And 13, they'd probably just... I don't know, you wouldn't need to reduce the damage. Actually, you wouldn't need to reduce the damage on any stuff. You're level 60. Unless, of course, they had like a level sync feature for them. But even then, at that point, you're really just doing it for the story anyway. So, it doesn't really matter. Why'd I say it like that? Oh, well. Next question. Hey, Mr. Happy, do you think the expansion will add new zones to the current areas? Feels like when you look at the map, we've not explored the regions completely. Glad you asked that, because it's recently been discovered that the West Shroud and the Corthus Lowlands, I think it is, have been found in uh, data mining or something like that. I saw it posted on the BG forums and whatnot. So uh, West Shroud, we've been told about that. That was, That's been off limits, really, for a while now. So West Shroud, more areas of Corthus, and then, of course, Heavensward areas, yeah. We're probably going to be expanding some of the old areas a little bit. Hello, Mr. Happy. I have a question for week 26. Do you think there will be more classes jobs other than the ones that have already been announced? Yoshi P already said no. There is no fourth job here they have revealed all of them. Said this in an interview with Famitsu very, very recently. So, uh, no. We probably won't get anything else. Yo, Happy. Long time watcher. First time asking anything. Don't know why I did this, but whatever. Do you think taking a Ramu weapon with bonus lightning resistance into turn 10 would mitigate any of the lightning damage we take from Amjigud? Or are his attacks unaspected? His da his attacks are lightning aspected. If you get to the last phase, he starts afflicting you with lightning with a lightning resistance down. But those th I, it's been calculated out by the community that resistance like fire lightning that it, it makes almost no difference whatsoever. I, if you if the Ramu weapon you have happens to be the best weapon that you have going into that, all right, it it might make like a few points difference, maybe like a couple at best. But it, it's not like a viable strategy. Be like, all right, everyone put on your Ramu weapons and we'll be good to go so uh yeah probably just not very good idea just get the best weapon you can get hey happy question i've been watching your vid since the aroma born beta thank you uh, i've noticed how much your channel has grown i'm wondering back if this is how you imagined it pretty cool to play a game and make a living off of it does it make it less fun in some ways and did you think it would turn out this way by the way when the expansion comes out i think your channel is going to explode with new people arriving thanks bud keep up the videos thank you for your kind words um it's not how i imagined it i'll be honest uh, one thing that I lost a lot when I first started doing YouTube is my ability to enjoy other games. Now, I lost that ability a long time ago with Final Fantasy XI, but when I got the YouTube channel in particular, I found myself unable to go out of my way to enjoy other game releases. And that's something that I've kind of been rectifying lately, going through my Steam playlist, trying to get some of those games done. And you know what? I'm learning to be able to do both, and that I can just post you know if i want to kill two birds with one stone and i want to play a game i post it on youtube you know um it definitely reduces the fun factor at times but then when i get on the live stream and i start you know just chilling and talking with people and everything it it reminds me that i love doing what i do and uh honestly i think i'm a very lucky person i'm blessed with a lot of people around me that support what i do they're interested in it they're not trying to shy me away from it and I would love to be able to just keep growing, keep doing what I do. I would, you know what I would love to do? I'd love to hit 100,000 subscribers. Because apparently YouTube gives out, like, silver and gold awards for, for 100,000 and a million subscribers. I would love to get that silver award. Prop it right up back there. Be like, that's right. I achieved that. I just like achievements. <laughs> but, uh, thanks for the question. And, um, well, thank you for your kind words as well. Next question. Do you think they should change the leveling? Fake grinding in dungeons get dull after the third class. Alright, so the other option would be to give you enough quests to do the process 1 to 50 again. And I think that is even more dull the second time around or third time around. That is one of my least favorite things about having the one class per character system that a lot of other MMOs have. Also, remember, fake grinding, dungeons, challenge log, leave quests are great EXP. Grand Company leaves especially for your first, second, and third class can help you get a lot of gear for your crafters and your gatherers. Recommend breaking it up, uh, spreading out how you level everything. Uh, 35 to 45 and 45 to 50 can become, ugh, make you want to Ugh. But one duty rule at a day is usually pretty easy. I don't see any way that they could do it other than adding a way to replay all the quests that you've already played. 
uh, like, wipe your memory of them, force you to play them again. That would be kind of weird, though. Uh, it would have to begin and end, basically, with the 2.0 storyline, and I don't really know how that would work, either. All right, next question. Hey, Happy. Hope you don't miss this one. Question for next week. I have noticed that players, including me, have mixed feelings about Archer and Bard since they wish to be ranged DPS without the support aspect. Do you think they might go the same way as with Arcanist or at least a new job for the Archer, like a Scout or a Hunter? In my opinion, it would make more sense if you look at the other class and jobs. Marauders are skilled with an axe and learn to be warriors. Swing it like a beast. Lancer becomes Dragoon, gets some mobility with their thrust. All jobs add to the respective class except for Archer Bard. Uh, why would you advance your archery by playing a harp? <laughs> Just saying. You have a pretty good point there at the end. I don't think you'll see any more jobs branching off of the old classes. Moving forward, I think we're going to strictly be getting new jobs while we retain the original, what is it, nine? Yeah, the original nine classes. Um, introducing a new class and a new job, it's, I don't know. A lot of people, I, I, I'm me included, don't like the Scholar Summoner system with Arcanist. It's cool in theory, but the only one decision you have to make is with your stats. And it's a stupid decision to have to make because it's the only decision we get to make. And it's cheap to change anyway. It's just, it's, it's dumb, in my opinion. So, I think what your answer to your question is going to be, play Machinist. Machinist is going to be a ranged DPS with a gun. They probably will have some supporting features, but almost every job, other than a dragon, <laughs> brings some form of raid-wide utility. Ninja brings goad and trick attack. Bard brings their songs, and they... <laughs> well, let's just pretend this matters. They bring the evasion down of raid attack. <laughs> let's just pretend that matters. They bring a bind. Uh, you know, Scholar has their has theirs. Uh, Summoner brings another battle res, another virus, another eye for an eye. Everybody brings something other than Dragoon. So Machinist will probably bring something as well, to be honest. But it'll probably be a much more hardcore, damage-oriented ranged DPS. Next question. Hi, Mr. Happy. Thank you for the great videos. I love watching these at work on a Saturday morning when they have the office to myself. Thank you, sir. Question for week 26. Have you heard of or looked up Black Desert? After the mention of less mainstream games, that is the one that has piqued my interest and I want to see more about it. I was curious about your thoughts. So, Black Desert, one of those games getting a lot of attention for its graphics. It has phenomenal graphics, but at its heart... It just looks like another Korean grind fest to me. One of those games that people are going to jump on. They're going to look at. They're going to be fascinated by the attention to detail and the super fast combat at first. And then they're going to realize they have to kill a thousand enemies to, to finish a single quest. And they're going to leave it alone. So I'm not very interested in it at all. I think it's a beautiful looking game. And it will probably, you know, have a few people that are really, really interested. The people who love those grindy MMOs. I'm not one of those people, believe it or not. I played 11 and 14. That, the Korean MMO Grindfest, is on a whole nother level. Silk Road Online still gives me nightmares. Mabby Nogi, the and Mabby Nogi Heroes Vindictus give me nightmares of how grindy they are. So I'm not super interested in it is what I'm trying to say. All right, so we got a couple more questions coming up, and that's going to be a wrap for this week. Uh, first question, morning. Well, not first. It's been a while. Morning, Mr. Happy. Got a question for week 26. I just got caught up with my Zodiac questline, and I'm waiting for patch 2.51 to tell me what to do next. And I got to thinking, they haven't made us use allied seals that much. Now I'm worried, since they don't do the big hunt parties, just do my daily weekly hunts, and that's going to take forever. What do you think the chances are they torture us like that? Zilch. Um, allied seals, I think they understand. People would rather use them on carbon twines and carbon coats anyway, and that's not a piece of content they need to repopulate. A lot of the Zodiac quests tend to repopulate old content. The hunts doesn't need to be repopulated right now. From what we understand, it's probably going to be a combination between, like, Atmas and Lights, almost. Uh, something with Magicite, if I remember correctly. I, I haven't read the quest text or anything like that that's been posted on the Blue Garter forums, but that's just what I've been hearing. So, I don't expect... Maybe Allied Seals might be one way of obtaining these items like it was with the uh, alexandrite you could totally use Al you could totally use allied seals to get all your alexandrite but you had other options i don't think they'll make the hunt the exclusive way to do anything with the zodiac quest line all right one more question after this how where do we ask a question you could ask the question right there well technically you did because i answered it so we got one more question after that just a uh, ask them in the comment section of the video all right, well, I figure if this is going to be the last one, it might as well be a long one. Hey, Mr. Haps, I'm going to have to cut this. This is so long. I'm going to have to cut this up into, like, sections. Hey, Mr. Haps, what's happening? 
Now I regret picking this question. Just kidding. Sorry about that, mate. Anyway, got one more question for you. Is choice an illusion in this game? I like where this question's going. I always hear that people want more stat options, more horizontal progression, and less team jump rope mechanics. And Hey, team jump rope, I just said that. In raids and more options and have more options and so on and so forth. There's nothing. If there's something I've learned playing this game, my first MMO, by the way, is that players always set themselves on the best and most optimal way to do anything. Just the other day, I tried doing turn two through the usual strategy, only to have a healer and a DPS ask us to do it the normal way. What's the normal way? Why enrage, of course? I think it would be a Herculean task for the devs to give us options that would actually make you think, oh, they go for X strategy or Y strategy, with little difference between the two. As opposed to what we currently have is, yeah, you can do X strategy, but screw that, man. We get this done a whole 10 minutes earlier by implying Y strategy. Uh, if it actually has you... If it actually has you thinking about whether you want to do X or Y, that is true balance, which is why I would find it be kind of hard to devs to achieve since they're going to set up, no, you got to do it this way or else it's a wipe way, way, way of thinking. So, technically... Every fight has multiple strategies. There's one core strategy you're trying to achieve, a way to counter a mechanic. The way from which the way at which you go about that is up to you. Now, normally there are mechanics, at least one or two in every fight, where there is the guaranteed best way to do it. It is the easiest, it requires the least amount of reaction out of the eight people that are involved, and that will almost always be the way that a group does it. Some groups learn it differently, and that's what they get used to, and that's just how they're going to do it because they're not interested in relearning it, even if it is in an overall easier way. So turn two is a pretty extreme example you give. That is a that is the single biggest case of a screw-up of tuning mechanics I think I've ever seen. Turn 2 and Rage has been around for so long that they were just like, by the time it was discovered and they could have done something about it, they're like, it's not going to matter soon. Just just do it. That's our bad. We're not going to punish you guys for doing that. Um, whereas, mm, what's a good, what's another good example? Turn 4. Some people do used to do a little bit differently, the kill order for a lot of the things. There was some general guidance. You could only do so much in the time that was given to you. Turn 5, you had people who would do the natural dodge strategy, but... Just like you've said, now the easiest strategy is to hide in a little dip in the corner. The twister locations used to be all different. As time goes on and people overgear things, you don't have to compensate for certain things. That easiest strategy gets uh, a lot more tuned down. Turn 6, super slug and line of sight method, two of the probably most popular strategies. The burn method being another one for the last phase. Turn 7, the strategy is just tank the ads and don't die at this point because it's so easy. But back in the day, there was the four stack strategy. There was the single stack and kill strategy. The positioning could be different. Some people tanked it in the middle. Some people tanked it against the wall. But those are the majority of the decisions you're going to make. And what it comes down to is they want you to beat the fight in a certain way. How you achieve that result is on you to discover what works best. What is the optimal positioning? And once that's been discovered, it's kind of hard to get people to just be like, well, let's do it the harder way. You know, path of least resistance will always be most popular, no matter what, because the internet. <laughs> the internet is a treasure trove of information, especially when it comes to strategies. Think even about single player games, it's the same thing, you know? There, you can play the game however you want, but if you go look it online, you will find the best ways to do certain things, and some people live and die by those methods. So, there's no, it's not that there's no illusion of choice, because there is, but the choices you have are limited within the boundaries of what has been set up for you. That is the best answer that I can really come up with for that. Especially as somebody who's done progression when something's brand new. I've seen these choices and the way that you start to make them and evolve them. I've seen that you do have the choice. It's just that the choice is limited. So that's my answer. Hopefully it was sufficient for the question. Thank you everyone for watching this week's Monday with my, blah, blah, blah. sorry, I'm not going to cut that out. Mondays with Mr. Happies. Uh, be sure to ask your questions next week in the comment section of the video below, just like the question I answered earlier. But anyway, guys, thanks for watching. See you guys next time. Till then, take care.